Today, I'm joined with Taka Ariga, the uh, Chief Data Scientist at the Government Accountability Office. This year, GAO is uh, marking its 100th anniversary at the Lincoln Network, where we, we will be hosting a series of conversations looking at how the Congressional Watchdog Agency uh, can modernize and improve its auditing uh, in its next 100 years. I'm thrilled to be joined by Taka, who leads the GAO's Innovation Lab. Taka, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Dan, for having me. Can you uh, help our audience by giving us a little bit about your background and how you came to join the GAO and lead the Innovation Lab? Yeah, absolutely. I've been around in the greater Washington, D.C. area for more than 20 years. And for most of that time, has been in the private sector. I uh, started out with CACI, CGI, Deloitte, Ernst & Young, and Booz Allen, uh, but had always focused on delivering federal agency relative to, you know, whether it's data science, whether it's other type of analytical work. Um, when I first heard about SCAA and GAO, uh, I was actually contacted by an external recruiter. And, you know, in my line of work, you, you do get a lot of random interest from recruiters. So um, I, I didn't necessarily pay a whole lot of attention to it. Uh, but at the time, I was really uh, sort of professionally wanting to do something other than focus on perhaps billable hours and profit margin. And what the, um, the, the sort of a, the potential uh, sort of outlines of what SDAA was doing, even though I wasn't uh, wholly familiar with the new team, was actually very attractive. Um, you know, the whole notion of driving innovation in the audit space is something that uh, I've been working on when I was at Deloitte and Ernst & Young and other places. Um, but the fact that a government agency was actually focused in this area was something that was quite attractive. And um, so combination of uh, the, that sort of a thought process along with um, potentially an area for me to really have the space to think about the art of possible and frankly be held accountable based on those strategy uh, was something that really attracted me to GAO. And uh, I have to say after a year and a half of doing this, I, I think I made the best career choice I could. That's terrific to hear. Now, uh, can you tell us a little more about what the Innovation Lab is, is doing and the really the vision or philosophy behind how you're trying to add value to the Government Accountability Office's work? For sure. Uh, our focus is very much forward looking uh, in terms of thinking the art of possible. Uh, we typically don't get involved in the day to day tax, uh, tactical execution of any audit engagement, uh, but we really try to sort of look at the grand challenges facing the, you know, the federal government and, and talk about, you know, how can we use data scientists uh, and, and, and emerging technologists to really uh, think about how do we develop solution prototypes um, to address those challenges. So that ranges from improper payments um, to continuous auditing to some of the digital ledger work that we're working on. Um, the idea here really is to focus on, an, on the art of possible and then have conversations around how future accountability methodology might be influenced by these capabilities. Um, so it's something that we, we do surround ourselves in a fair amount of ambiguity on a day, day in and day out basis. Uh, but I think that is the, the really the, uh, the, the ethos of the Innovation Lab. And it's really the fun piece for us to really put the thinking cap on to say, how can we tackle this problem differently? Um, and how can we tackle you know problem in a more sort of innovative and novel ways? You mentioned that you joined the, um, the STA um, a year and a half ago. Um, over the past year, we've had this unprecedented challenge of the global pandemic. Can you talk about uh, some of the work that uh, the Innovation Lab has been doing, in, including in their overseeing and response? Yeah, yeah. We're, we're still very much true to our original mission of working on what we call the minimally viable product, which essentially are prototyping uh, using data science and emerging technology. But over the past 12 months or so, um, our scope have expanded partly is in response to the pandemic, uh, but partly is in response to uh, just a general push for modernization. So now we're actually supporting GAO's modernization. Uh, we have recently launched a very strategic effort around building uh, greater data literacy across all of GAO's workforce. 
And accompanying that is how do we strengthen our data governance so that we can ingest and, and, and leverage more and more of the data assets that are coming to the agency all the time. And then the, the, the third piece here in terms of expansion of our scope is much more active engagement with our stakeholders. Uh, so whether that's the Congress itself, whether that's the SIGI community, the state and local um, and international partnership, we want to make sure that either our lessons learned or success stories are shared widely um, so that folks can build on the work that we have done and not necessarily uh, having to sort of start from scratch. Um, and in terms of uh, specific pandemic related oversight work, uh, one of the very sort of uh, early prototype that we developed um, as the pandemic was um, sort of uh, you know, brewing in the background was the COVID dashboard and it was intended for our internal audience consumption. Um, we were very careful uh, in terms of not trying to act like CDC or WHO because those are not part of our mission statement, but how do we take a more hyper local focus around jurisdictions of GAO in terms of operating areas and uh, essentially backing up all of the hospitalization data, death rates data, infection data, and for us to develop a operational oriented dashboard that are helping our um, executive committee to make those decisions relative to when to open, how to open. Um, it's been a year since we uh, deployed that internal dashboard and it's something that we're quite proud of in terms of uh, adding feature uh, incrementally to support GEO's operational needs. Uh, but also doing our own uh, simulation in terms of identifying, you know, whether trends in any given jurisdiction is going up or down. Um, how does that impact relative to some of the operational, um, you know, opening decision? Uh, but aside from that, you know, certainly SDAA has done a number of pandemic-related technology assessment, whether that's on operation warp speed, whether that's on contact tracing, data quality. Um, we have also done a number of really quick hitting spotlights on topics like genomic sequencing of infectious pathogens, uh, vaccine safety, herd immunity, COVID-19 modeling, social distancing, et cetera, that are really meant to be timely but easily consumable type of output uh, while you know, we're, we're continuing to sort of address the, the ramification from the, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic itself. That's really exciting to hear. When we first um, spoke about a year and a half ago, when you were joining the GAO, um, I, we were talking about um, your plans. And one of the ideas that you were talking about that got me really excited was your plan to work on improper payments. As a former congressional staffer, I worked on the Senate committee that uh, oversaw that issue in government spending and transparency. And you had some really interesting ideas about how data science and uh, new analytic tools could be applied to that problem, which is really huge in scope for our viewers out there. Uh, last year, GAO estimated that uh, across the government, there was $175 billion in um, misspent or um, improper payments made. Um, and out of that total amount, about 75 billion was con considered a loss for the federal government. When we think about the big challenges facing the federal government um, from the pandemic to the ongoing response and the growing debt burden is a huge, huge problem. Uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about how uh, the uh, Innovation Lab and your capabilities might be applied to helping Congress oversee that. Thanks, Dan. Um, as you alluded, GAO, along with other oversight entity issue, a myriad of improper payments report. Uh, so my colleagues at the financial management and assurance team from GAO, uh, they have issued the, the figure that you've cited. And I think in the past year that has actually exceeded 200 billion. And it seems like the number just keeps on growing regardless of the recommendation, regardless of the remediations. Um, so this is really where we had an opportunity to step back to say, how can we do something different and tackle this ever-growing challenge for federal government. Um, one thing that we didn't necessarily want to do is to yet be another voice in the chorus of here's a list of recommendations for any given agency to sort of um, remediate. I think IG and, and many of other GAO team has that areas uh, covered pretty well. Um, so we, we started to think, think about in terms of two hypotheses. How might we make greater difference 
instead of like individual agency tackling their individual agencies and proper payments issue, how might we improve the situation if we collaborate across different agencies? Um, and so that was sort of a, a first thorny hypothesis that we had to sort of uh, de identify a way to move forward. Um, GAO traditionally, because of our independence within the legislative branch, don't always um, collaborate within the executive agency, uh, you know, for independence reasons, for other um, sort of jurisdictional reasons as well. But what we were able to identify is a this statutory framework called the Joint Financial Management Improvement Program, or JFMIP for short, where GAO comes together with Treasury, OMB, and OPM to, to really think through uh, challenges facing the financial management community. And so this seemed like a perfect statutory framework for us to test out that hypothesis of if we collaborate with other agency, might we be able to make greater impacts relative to the issue of improper payments? So that was hypothesis number one. Um, and then the second question is, once we get together, what are we going to be working on? Um, we, you know, obviously for sort of resource constrained reason, uh, we won't be able to boil the ocean per se, but we want to make sure that we are tackling a challenge that are specifically meaningful, uh, but novel enough in the area of improper payments that we think we can really um, make a difference. Uh, so after much discussion with OMB, um, with Tim Soltis and, and other stakeholders, uh, we decided that we wanted to tackle the, the area of identity verification. Uh, so, you know, for background context, there are a lot of eligibility verification happening across federal benefits, you know, whether it's Social Security Administration, whether it's IRS, is TACA eligible to receive this kind of benefit based on the criteria that I submit? What it's not as prevalent is the notion of is Taka who he says he is. Um, and so that the notion of identity verification, uh, while Social Security Administration and IRS have some capacity in those areas, that is not widely applied to other federal benefits. Um, so this is an area that we wanted to tackle to see, can identity verification in fact be a meaningful strategy towards preventing uh, improper payments. And it turns out this topic was actually um, very timely in, in light of the pandemic relief where uh, now you know, multiple trillions of dollars are now floating through not only across the federal agency, but also down to the state and the local level. Um, so we're very excited to partner with, again, OPM, Treasury, and, uh, and OMB uh, with a two-part scope. The first part is to convene a panel of experts to really talk about what might be leading practices, whether it's you know, technical, performance, societal impact, et cetera, around uh, identity verification. Um, so we're convening a wide a sort of um, a perspective, you know, industry provider, financial services, agency themselves, state and local partner, international partners, to really talk about, you know, how could identity verification work within a sort of public sector space? What are some of the you know, best practices? What are some of the lessons learned? Uh, and the second part of this collaboration is really take those recommendations, turn them into potential controls and be able to simulate the effects of those controls. Um, one of the questions that we're really interested in is, you know, it seems like identity verification is a good idea but we want to be able to quantify how good of an idea that is. Is it 10%, 20%, 30%? Um, so it's a bit of a chicken or the egg problem. There's not an existing data sets that we can readily collect to say, let us isolate the, you know, the variables and, and contributing factors in terms of uh, how beneficial an identity verification could be. Um, so we're starting from a point of having to develop synthetic data sets and apply a sort of a simulation technology to say, given different types of control, what might be the impact based on the characteristics of the demographics, the characteristics of the program that you're trying to address, um, and, and really starting the ability to quantitatively uh, articulate whether identity verification, in fact, is a useful uh, part of the, the equation. 
Um, so it's something that we're uh, you know, very much uh, excited to working on and, and in collaboration, like again, you know, under the JFMIP um, sort of principal players, uh, we're hoping to be able to issue the initial report by the end of this calendar year. Um, so I, I think that's an example where it's not just, um, uh, you know, the specific areas of, of, of um, identity verification. I think coming out of the JFMIP, there may be other uh, areas that we could focus on in terms of addressing the improper payments challenges. For your customers on, on Capitol Hill, um, there's great interest in trying to, to solve this problem. As you are um, doing this, uh, this study over the, um, the balance of the year, um, do you have other thoughts on how uh, the innovation lab might be applied and in involved in the improper payments oversight process? As you may know, there was a, um, uh, a bipartisan congressional law passed last year, which uh, aligned some of the different um, improper payments uh, laws from the past. Uh, several have been uh, passed over the past 20 years. Um, from my read of them, there's still a lot of backward looking um, compliance driven approach to trying to solve this problem. In the past, we've talked about how there may be ways to do some uh, form of continuous auditing to try and you know, more aggressively try and tackle this problem. Do you have any thoughts you could share? Uh, plenty. Um, I think one area that may sort of hold promise is the notion of blockchain and distributed ledger and how might that change in terms of how payment are processed and with a real-time assurance around the underlying of veracity of that information. But you mentioned continuous auditing. Um, that is something that is a personal passion of mine. And, and I, I know within the financial management community and the accounting community, there's been a lot of talks about the need for continuous auditing. Uh, but at least in, from my perspective, I haven't seen a really credible manifestation of those ideas. Um, and, and that sort of spans my experience in the private sector, but now in GAO as well. Um, so one of the very first projects that we tackle on is, is exactly the notion of the continuous auditing. What does that mean? How does it work? What tools do we bring about um, to, uh, to make that happen? Uh, for the innovation lab specifically, we are looking at how we can apply a, a special type of database called graph database in terms of mapping out the relationship between the transaction as well as the attributes of those transactions. Um, and so we took that as an approach uh, to say, you know, could this be a meaningful way for us to make continuous auditing possible? Uh, the short answer is yes. I mean, by uh, sort of mapping out all of the transaction and the relationship in between them, uh, you're really able to now apply not only very novel data science algorithm on that network, um, but because of the, the advent of computational horsepower, you're now able to host that entire network as opposed to rely on the traditional approach of sampling, you know, statistical sampling selection. Um, and a lot of our uh, traditional work still involves every 12 month, we collect discrete set of data and only focus on that discrete 12 month period. Um, so the notion of continuous auditing uh, for us is how do we leverage um, different construct in terms of managing the data, but also how do we host that information on a persistent basis so that we can incrementally work towards um, uh, sort of more of a uh, sort of addition to the data as opposed to, you know, every 12 months we decided to collect a new set of data. Um, that's something that we're continuing to work towards. Um, has already yielded a very sort of interesting set of not only capabilities, but I think uh, we're also identifying certain methodological challenges that we do need to overcome. Uh, an example of that is, you know, if we were able to make continuous auditing possible, how does that blur the line between the responsibilities of the management versus the responsibility of an auditor? Um, on, on one extreme, you can envision a scenario where a management could say, because the auditors have continuous auditing capability, we'll just let the auditor find the problems um, and let them tell us what needs to be fixed. Um, on the opposite spectrum, uh, you know, auditors may not necessarily have the ability to consume all that continuous information to drive the continuous auditing. So how do we find that right balance between capability, methodology, independence? Um, that's something that um, it's, it's actually fascinating to me and we're continuing to make progress around continuous auditing. 
uh, once we're able to make some uh, you know, really sort of tangible prototypes, I think we may have a, a, a sort of a nuggets of a additional hypothesis relative to improper payments on how continuous auditing could be a beneficial uh, construct. To, to be able to um, attempt something like this, um, perhaps as a pilot project or proof of concept, what type of mandate would you need? Um, is it a, a congressional request or um, some sort of statutory authority to uh, allow the innovation lab to tap into this data that should be flowing to agencies for them to be monitoring their improper payments? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. I mean, GAO certainly always strive to serve congressional requests, uh, whether those come from committees or individual members of the Congress. Um, and I expect there are probably some policy limitation that exists currently in terms of how uh, we might be able to make, for example, continuous auditing or even blockchain possible. I'll give one example. Uh, we're currently working with another agency to really explore the, the inner guts of the blockchain relative to cybersecurity control, relative to you know, how does it work if we host different uh, versions of a ledger across different agency. Um, one potential issue that came up was relative to you know, whether uh, an agency has a statutory authority to see uh, the secondary and tertiary transaction beyond the prime contractor. So, you know, when that prime um, issue, let's say grant to a sub grantee to sub sub grantee, uh, there are some questions around the statutory limitation on the agency's visibility into that information. So I think that's an example where we also wanna identify in addition to the capabilities, uh, but potentially make some policy recommendation for Congress to also consider. Um, and I think, you know, relative to improper payments, one of the perennial challenge uh, for agency is the notion of data sharing and data access. Um, you know, one, one pretty straightforward example of, of this is sort of a Social Security Administration death master file. Um, not every program has statutory access to that information. And then even if you do, there are some practical uh, sort of implementation barrier in terms of who hosts that information um, and should a centralized entity do so? Should individual agency do so? Does that end up creating duplicative processing capabilities? Um, so those are the kind of uh, practical barriers that I think Innovation Lab serves well in terms of just uh, hypothesizing and developing different constructs to say, how might we tackle this issue? Um, and so along that line, part of our work with JFMIP is really to sort of develop this researchable question in terms of what are some of the policy barriers in existence today and what may be some of the recommendations that could come out of this. Uh, one example of that is perhaps we can leverage FFRDC in terms of like miters of the world in terms of be able to host that data. Now that's just a, a sort of hypothesis at this point. Um, we want to make sure that there are issues that we can address relative to accessibility, relative to the legal statutes, relative to um, uh, even just uh, you know the very uh, you know technical challenges around how do you um, identify different variations of common last names like Smith, for example, um, so that we don't end up creating a significant level of false positive that are actually counter to the, um, you know, some of the expediency in terms of the payment that needs to go out uh, during the pandemic. This is fascinating. I love hearing you talk about this. Um, we've talked a lot about improper payments and the potential to use your capabilities to address that national challenge. Um, but there are lots of different ways that I think are really exciting um, to envision how your new um, approaches to data science to enhance auditing could, um, could make a real contribution and help policymakers understand root causes of some of the biggest day-to-day uh, -day problems facing Americans around the country. Um, one issue that's been uh, up top of mind for policymakers over the past decade is uh, trying to um, address the root crisis of the, um, the opioid overdose epidemic. We, we're having hundreds and hundreds of people on average passing away every day from, from opioids. Um, with the pandemic, we're getting somewhat desensitized to daily death counts of in the thousands, but um, it's been staggering how many lives have been lost. Um, and uh, I know on Capitol Hill over the past um, several Congresses, there've been lots of bipartisan efforts to try and understand that. And as a, a data scientist, I'd love to 
get your advice um, to, to help us understand how might we look at um, you know, different ways that data could answer the question of how can policy change and address this problem? Yeah, absolutely. I, I think the opiate epidemic, it's similar to you know, many other multidisciplinary issues that the way I view it, it's almost like a funnel. Uh, on, the, on the front end, there should be a wide aperture relative to many different types of information that we can blend in together. But on the back end, it's more of a streamlining sort of output in terms of the kind of researchable metrics that we're trying to identify to answer those questions. Um, so, you know, just thinking off the top of my head, I, I would love to be able to combine, let's say, the CMS VA prescription data with FDA's you know, drug approval data, with the census demographic data, with contract award data, and maybe even add together some of the postal service shipping information around where are some of these drugs being shipped to. And I think, you know, if you have the ability to combine those disparate data sets, um, which by the way, is no easy undertaking, um, I think you can come up with interesting findings relative to patterns and behavior that may contribute to policy making to some of the you know, mitigation strategy. Um, you know, I mentioned, you know, this is no sort of easy task, you know, if even if we had a magic wand to be able to combine all this data, um, there are sort of policy barriers, there's technical barriers, there are some, you know, analytical data science barriers to it. Um, you know, one layer above that, uh, I, I think we have talked about the importance of, of artificial intelligence. And there's been some talk of you establishing a national research cloud in order to be able to ingest just massive quantity and volumes of data to support development of AI solution. Um, I think such a construct of national research cloud shouldn't be just limited to, let's say, AI development. I think something like that could be easily and equally applicable to something like opio epidemic, where if you think of it, this sort of a funnel paradigm, uh, a national research cloud can, you know, in theory, be able to ingest these all source, all source information and then be able to process them and, and identify really concrete researchable metrics to support policy development. Um, so I, I'm, I'm a big proponent of in terms of making sure that we are leveraging the, the scalability of the cloud and be able to sort of take advantage of the modernization that agencies themselves are doing to develop that capacity in a way that can tackle many of these multidisciplinary challenges and not necessarily view them as a zero sum game. You know, we, I think we can tackle the AI challenges simultaneously with the OPO crisis. And as a matter of fact, there are probably some very interesting synergy where we might be able to apply some of the AI competency to develop, for example, simulations uh, or other predictive models so that you know, policymakers are not always playing reactive role, but how can we sort of more prospectively um, identify patterns and behavior perhaps three, five, seven years down the road? Looking forward, if, if we were having this conversation in a couple of years, you, where do you think we, the innovation lab will be or where do you hope to be um, uh, based on the current trajectory? Yeah, no, that, that's an interesting question. Uh, we're still scaling up the innovation lab, uh, you know, hiring data scientists uh, on, uh, under the ordinary circumstances, no easy task, much less during the pandemic. Um, so, you know, we're, we're, we're still scaling up relative to personnel, relative to our infrastructure. Um, we're still doing a lot of outreach to the mission team inside GAO to really talk about uh, how can we think differently? How do we empower these mission team and operations team to think differently? Um, I think there's more we can do in terms of conversation with Congress, conversation with our state, local, and, and federal partners uh, relative to uh, data science capability, um, but also knowledge sharing. Um, I, I think one of my one of my sort of frustration in seeing many uh, public sector or entities trying to do innovation is that everybody is essentially in, in their own bubble, uh, right? Nobody's really um, sharing in terms of what has worked, what hasn't worked. There's not a sort of easy mechanism for that kind of uh, horizontal um, sort of a success sharing. Um, so our goal uh, from an innovation lab perspective 
is you know to make that process as easy as we can um whether that's using something like a GitHub to share some of our artifacts, whether that's, uh, you know, for every engagement that we take on, we make sure that we have a white paper associated with it um, so that uh, others can consume that information and understand the approach that we took that may have worked or may not have worked and then be able to build upon um, uh, our, our methodology. And so, you know, if there's one thing I would like for the Innovation Lab to be able to do more is that sort of a cross-cutting knowledge sharing uh, beyond the capacity building that we're, we're still working through. Well, it's to your credit that um, uh, the Comptroller General continues to call for requests of new funding for the STAA and his uh, recent testimony mentioned the Innovation Lab. It's really exciting to see where you are uh, taking this, this effort. Um, any last message to our audience, um, including our friends on Capitol Hill who are um, still a little um, uh, learning about your work any um, last advertisement of, of uh, how you can help policymakers uh, answer these, these pressing challenges? Yeah, I, I think one of the beauty of, in, the, in terms of the way that Innovation Lab set up was that we have the capacity to ab absorb some of the risks as compared to GAO's mission team, right? When they are working actively working on audit engagement, it's very difficult for them to say, let me try something different. Let me try something novel. The way that Innovation Lab is set up is we don't usually get involved in the day-to-day -day execution of this engagement. What that really means is that we can take risk relative to exploring the questions that are so important, not only to the GAO mission team, but also to the American public and, and the, our congressional stakeholders as well. Um, so it really is, is, I think Innovation Lab is a, is a great resource um, to the you know, to our congressional stakeholders, but also to other agencies as well to really think about, you know, how can we explore um, problems involving improper payments or opioid crisis or any uh, any number of given areas uh, without being constrained by, let's say, the auto methodology or um, uh, sort of technology capabilities. We have the flexibility to explore the art of possible and we don't necessarily expect success uh, right away. Uh, we understand innovation. Part of the, the equation here is the potential failure. Um, if we're always successful in terms of developing our capability, it probably means that we're not taking enough risks. Uh, at the same time, if we're always failing, uh, we're not being a good steward of the, the public um, you know, taxpayers' dollars. So we're trying to find that right balance in terms of how do we aggressively explore the art of possible, but really, really focus on beyond prototype, how can those prototype be scaled into a you know, specific solution? And so this is where I think having uh, a variety of conversation, not only within our mission team, but also with congressional stakeholders, uh, usually generate, aha, uh -huh, you know, how can we explore this problem differently uh, than before? And so, you know, looking forward to additional engagement, you know, Dan, I know you've been introducing uh, SCAA and an Innovation Lab to your contacts, so we're, we're really grateful for that. Um, I, I think Innovation Lab, it, it's a unique construct, uh, not, you know, certainly within GAO, but also I think within the federal government as well in terms of our focus is really just to think about the art of possible. And, but we wanna make sure that those art of possible are then connecting to the grand challenges facing the American public. This is excellent. Um, we really appreciate what you're doing at the GAO and uh, your time and sharing these thoughts with us this morning, Taka. Thank you so much. Happy to, it was an honor. Thank you so much, Dan. Thank you.